Well, thank you all for zooming in and welcome today to today's lecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce Alison Schreier and the topic is how to be a friend to someone with dementia. Alison is the program manager, project coordinator at uh, UW Memory and well Brain Wellness Center. And uh, she's on the ECHO team and she can explain what that is. Um, her team includes Dr. Gaster, who spoke with us at uh, Emerald Hall live two years ago, and also with uh, Dr. Lee Burnside, who's on the Mirabella Seattle board. Thank you for being here for my talk about how and why to be friends with people who are living with dementia. So uh, my journey with dementia started um, Back here, back in 2012, when my uh, very sweet husband was diagnosed with dementia. Until that time, my background was in technology. I was a stay-at-home mom. And then my husband in his 40s was diagnosed with something called frontotemporal dementia after many years of trying to figure out what was going on with him because neurologists are not really used to seeing people that young. 5% or fewer of people with a form of dementia are younger than the age of 65. So I had the experience of being a family caregiver. And then eventually my, my husband moved into um, several different care communities. So over that period of time, I became uh, very curious about this thing called dementia. I wanted to be the best caregiver that I could possibly be. So I started studying with some people who I will mention today, who are some of my dementia heroes. And I earned some different kinds of certifications, um, qualifying me to teach different kinds of um, different aspects of dementia care. These days, uh, my, my job is that I teach four days a month in long-term care communities where I teach the Washington State DSHS mandated dementia courses that are required for anybody who wants to work in long-term care. So we do a day long deep dive into what is dementia and how do you care for people. My main job is that, as was mentioned, I'm with the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center, where I manage something called Project ECHO. Project ECHO is a program aimed at education again, but this time we are educating primary care providers in rural and um, under-resourced areas of Washington state to bump up uh, outcomes around dementia detection, diagnosis, and support. And the way that we do that is twice a month in a room just like this one, in a Zoom room, we bring in dementia experts. One of those is Dr. Gaster. Another one is Lee Burnside. And we bring in doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners from all over Washington state. And together we enjoy a 15 minute lecture that's a deep dive about some aspect of dementia. And then the people who are attending bring in cases and together we explore those cases. So the goal is to allow people throughout Washington state to be treated locally rather than need to always go to Harborview to get help with their dementia symptoms. And then the third thing that I do is I have um, a project that is sort of my passion project. I and some friends have created this thing called Zinnia TV. It's um, zinniatv.com and it is a, an application. You can run it on your computer or on your laptop on, or your, on your iPhone. And it is intended to be engaging for people with mid to late stage dementia. And they're very fun videos that are very specifically designed to be digestible by people with mid to late stage dementia and to encourage communication and connection with the people who care for them. So that's all the stuff that I do. And why am I here today? It's because of this. So after I was diagnosed, my friends stopped coming around to see me. Finally, I called one of them and asked him, why don't you come see me anymore? And he said, Richard, I just don't know what to say. 
And I said, how about hello? This is a quote from Dr. Richard Taylor, who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. He passed away from cancer. Uh, however, before he did that, he created this organization called Dementia Alliance International. It is a, um, a policymaking group for people who have a diagnosis of dementia. If I were to get a diagnosis of dementia, I would join this organization. Their motto is there is no about us without us. And it's about advocacy. It's about people living with a diagnosis coming out and saying, hey, we're still here and we're still viable and we still have a lot going on. Listen to us and pay attention to our messaging. And this experience that Dr. Taylor had was pretty similar to my own experience with my husband. There were people who I really thought were going to be there for us through thick and thin, and some of them were, but some of the people who I thought we would really be able to rely on went away. And there were people who I never would have thought in a million years would have been some of our primary advocates, but they kind of came out of the woodwork. And so I started really wondering about why is it that some people are really present and other people aren't? And I think some of it has to do with fear and some of it has to do with whether or not people have a curiosity about how do you be with people who are living with dementia? And I think for a lot of people, it's a mystery. They're a little scared. And so my, one of my missions is to educate people about what is dementia, how do you appropriately be with and support people with dementia so that they can remain active and connected members of our communities. So today we're going to do um, a quick dementia overview. I want to talk about normal aging versus Alzheimer's disease. We'll explore the impacts of dementia on a person's skills. We'll talk about some of my dementia heroes and talk about how we communicate with compassion. I've also tossed in some slides that talk about resources that are available for people uh, who live in the Seattle area. So what is dementia? Really briefly, there, there is no such thing as a dementia diagnosis. There's no disease called dementia. There are over a hundred diseases that qualify as a dementia. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. The top four that you tend to hear about are the ones that are on your screen right now. Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body and frontotemporal dementia. So these are all diagnoses. And when I say that there are a hundred or more diseases that qualify as a dementia, a bunch of those are actually different variants of these diseases. So there is, there's not just Alzheimer's disease anymore. There are different flavors of Alzheimer's disease. So these four diseases, and the thing that they have in common is that they share some different kinds of symptoms, but they have a few other things in common, which I'll talk about in a moment. And so these most common dementias, Alzheimer's is the one that we see mostly 50 to 80% of the time. And what people are really, um, what most people are familiar with is this kind of rapid forget forgetting Alzheimer's is absolutely a dementia that has, that is an amnesic form of dementia. People tend to lose short-term memory earlier and they hang on to their longer-term memories. They can have this rapid forgetting where even for a minute, they forget what was just said and they keep asking the same question over and over again. So lots of repetition. There's problem with word finding um, and the ability to solve problems. And vascular dementia presents a lot like Alzheimer's disease. These three guys, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, and frontotemporal dementia are all basically formed, uh, caused by proteins in your brain that are misbehaving. They're different, pro they're different in each of those three cases, but that's what happens is that proteins are doing things they're not supposed to do, brain tissue is dying, and people's brains are actually getting smaller. So the brain of somebody who has died from dementia can be about a third smaller than it would otherwise have been. Vascular dementia is the one that's really different. Vascular dementia is caused by um, an unhealthy cardiovascular system. So it's when people are getting little mini strokes, for instance. So it's entirely possible for people to have multiple dementias 
it's not unusual that somebody has, for instance, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. When my husband passed away, he donated his brain to science and they discovered that he had frontotemporal dementia primarily, but he also had Alzheimer's disease. However, the Alzheimer's disease was so insignificant that he probably would not have been symptomatic. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that doctors make a distinction between Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease with dementia because it's possible to have any of these things building up in your system for up to 20 years before you become symptomatic. What, what we're working on more these days in the science world is less a cure and more trying to figure out how do we extend that period of progression. So if I know that I can have this stuff going on in my brain for 20 years before I become symptomatic, whoa, what if we could stretch that out to 30 years or 40 years? So I would maybe die in my 90s of something else before my dementia symptoms ever kicked in. So lifestyle is um, a contributor to how long that period of progression is. I'm gonna to toss out a name for you. I see some of you writing notes. There's a report called the Lancet 2020, L-A-N-C-E-T 2020. I think I might mention it somewhere else in this talk, but the Lancet 2020 is a really outstanding report. And it gives a big list of all of the things that you would change in your life if you wanted to extend that period of time. Right now, doctors reckon that about 40% of the people who are living with a dementia diagnosis have a disease that could have been prevented. And it's never too late to start making those changes. So Lewy body dementia, um, onset is a little bit younger generally than Alzheimer's disease. It is the only dementia for which hallucinations are pretty typical, um, and especially earlier on in the disease. There is a genetic link between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease. So if somebody with Parkinson's disease develops a dementia, it'll typically be a Lewy body dementia. And then frontotemporal dementia, look at that, the onset 40 to 60. So certainly there are people with young onset Lewy body and people with young onset Alzheimer's. And by young, I mean younger than 65, but most of the earliest dementias are frontal temporal dementia. And while all three of these guys, Alzheimer's, vascular disease and Lewy body have a memory component, that is really not the case with frontotemporal dementia, which is why it's so hard to diagnose. People are really young, and they don't have memory problems. That's kind of the hallmark that we think of as, as um, dementia. Instead, because it's frontal lobe, that's your center of executive functioning. So people start to behave kind of like somebody whose frontal lobe has not developed yet. They start behaving a lot like a 13 year old. So in my case, my kids were 12 and 15 and my husband was like 13. So it was, it was a challenging time. Any, is that okay if I move on from this? I just wanted to give you a really quick blush of what these things are. Yeah, okay, cool. So four truths about dementia. So I said there are like a hundred diseases that qualify as a dementia, but there's something that, and that they have different proteins. One is caused by an unhealthy cardiovascular system, but they all have four things in common. The four things that they have in common are that they impact at least two parts of the brain. And the two parts of the brain that are impacted indicate what the skill set is that's going to be lost. So with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, the two parts of the brain that are impacted are the left temporal lobe, which has to do with language. And so that's where people will, in the beginning, start losing words. Um, they mean to ask for the salt, but they ask for the, ask for the sugar, but they ask for the salt. Um, and I know that all of you are like, oh my God, I have Alzheimer's disease because I do that. We all do that. We all do that sometimes. We all forget words, right? How many of us are like, hey, babe, while you're in the kitchen, would you grab the, um... oh, for crying out loud. You know that, oh God, right? We all do that. And that's because we're distracted. It's because as we age, our brain doesn't process as well. By the time we're 59 years old or so, we will have lost, like mid fifties, we'll have lost about 9% of our brain's processing power. And then you lose another 9% per decade. 
So what does that translate into? It means that things don't happen as fast. It's one of the reasons that we have more, of, we're more of a fall risk when we get older. Right now with my big fat healthy brain, I trip over a cord and my brain says, right foot forward fast. But as I get older and my processing speed slows down, my brain's like, right foot, I don't know. Oh yeah, forward. And by then I'm already on my nose on the floor. So two parts of the brain. And as I said, with Alzheimer's disease, it's language. And eventually what that devolves into is people who speak almost kind of a gibberish. They know what they're saying, but they've lost the ability to form the words. The other part of the brain with Alzheimer's disease is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the seat of memory and wayfinding. And so that translates into people who get lost. We all get lost from time to time. I've been driving down I-5 headed for Issaquah and suddenly I'm in uh, Michigan, down by Michigan Avenue. And it's because I sort of spaced out, I wasn't paying attention and now I'm not where I thought I was and it takes me a minute to figure out where I am. That happens. But what we're talking about is somebody in a familiar place who cannot find their way. Um, and it's and starting to happen in a more regular um, basis. So that's the wayfinding piece. And then the memory piece is what I talked about. So when I, um, when my mom who has dementia comes into me and says, um, hey, honey, um, I'm going to be going out for the thing. And I, I'm just wondering, when should I be back for dinner? And I say, well, mom, dinner's going to be at seven. And mom says, oh, okay, because I've got a I've got the other thing and, and, and I just wait, but I need to be, when are we eating? Well, mom, we're eating at seven. And what happened is that when the first time I said, mom, we're eating at seven, when that information entered her brain, it went to her hippocampus to sit on a shelf, but there was no shelf there because brain tissue is actually gone. And so the takeaway message there is Nobody's being willful. When somebody asks the same question over and over and over again, it's because their brain is not working. So two parts of the brain. And so therefore the parts of the brain that are impacted with Lewy body dementia are different than the parts of the brain that are impacted with Alzheimer's disease, different than the parts of the brain that are impacted with frontotemporal dementia and vascular dementia behaves much like Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is chronic. Every one of these diseases is chronic, meaning that you have it every day. May seem different every day. People tend to have a skill, kind of lose it, get it back a little bit, lose it a little bit, get it back a little bit. And then they sort of maybe go downhill a little bit and they've lost the skill altogether. But there tends to be this sort of wavy pattern of being able to do something and not being able to do something. Well, I know she knows how to do her laundry. She did her laundry yesterday. Yup, she did it yesterday. And today she can't remember how to do laundry. Tomorrow she might remember again. We need to be so forgiving of the people that we love who are living with dementia. The third, as I've already mentioned, is that these diseases are progressive. Unlike, for instance, if I flew off of a phone pole, off of my bicycle and hit a phone pole with my head and I um, damaged my frontal lobe, I'm going to behave a lot like a person with a frontal lobe dementia except that it's not necessarily progressive and it's only one part of the brain, just to make a distinction. And all dementias at this point in time are fatal. So there's a group called Dementia Friends and they are all about proliferating messaging about how to be friends with people living with dementia. And I do some work for them. They have a very set curriculum that I sometimes um, deliver places. They have five key messages that I would like to share with you here. The first one is that dementia is not a normal part of aging. So by the time you turn like 65 or so, you have about a like, you know, five to 10% chance of developing dementia symptoms in the next year. By the time you're 85, it's more like 35 to 40% chance that you will develop dementia system symptoms this year. But what that means, like the bad news is that you have a 35 to 40% chance of having dementia when you're in your 80s. But the good news is that you have a 60% chance 
um, to 65% chance that you're not going to develop dementia. Dementia is caused by diseases of the brain. It's not people just choosing to be willful and challenging. And as you now know, dementia isn't just about memory problems. There's a whole lot more to it, which we will be discussing in more detail. It is absolutely possible to have a good quality of life with dementia. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail. You know, the messaging for years, it's like, it's kind of like where we were with cancer many years ago. Like, have you talked to Bob? No, what is it, what, why? Well, his wife has cancer, right? That's the way it was a long time ago. And that's kind of the way that people are now with dementia, unfortunately. And I'm a stigma, stigma buster. I'm all about like, let's tell people because I, um, I really believe that people should be candid about what's going on with them. And people need to learn how to be with people with dementia and accept that it is possible to have a good quality of life. And of course, there's way more to the person than just their dementia. And the thing that I always encourage everybody to do is think about this, about what would happen if we assumed that everybody in our life is actually doing the best they can. I had a great big roll of paper, like a four foot wide roll of paper, and I rolled out about a 10 foot piece and I tacked it to my wall when I was living with my husband, when, when my husband was living at home with dementia and I wrote in really big letters, he's doing the best he can. And I went multiple times a day to stand in front of that piece of paper to help me be a more patient and caring love and loving care partner. So let's talk a little bit about normal aging versus um, Alzheimer's disease. So memory that disrupts daily life. So I'm gonna play out a little scenario for you. And the scenario is that I am getting ready to leave my house. I have a big, fat, healthy brain. I'm getting ready to leave my house um, to go to a family gathering. As I leave the house, I walk out, uh, I walk, put on my coat, I walk through the living room and there's my sweet old dog lying on the sofa, sleeping. And I think, oh man, I should probably put some food out for him. So I go back to the kitchen and on the way to the kitchen, my phone rings. Yeah. Now let me stop for a moment and say, our brains, our healthy brains are able to hold between five, let me get my hands up there, five and eight things in working memory. And what's in my working memory right now is feed the dog. So I get into the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, hi. It's my sister. I'm going to her house. Yeah, no, I was just leaving. What, the blue sweater? Yeah, but don't get anything on it. No, I, yeah, I'll bring that. Oh, okay, I can bring the shoes too. Yeah, no, 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 that's not a problem. No, I've already put some stuff out in the car. Okay, on and on we go. I hang up the phone. Where is feed the dog? Gone. So how do I... But, but here I am with my big healthy brain. I stand in the kitchen and I think, why am I in the kitchen? How many of you have had this experience? You open the refrigerator door and you stand there and you think, why am I in the refrigerator, right? I got distracted. The reason why I'm in the kitchen left my head. But because I have a healthy brain, I know that I have forgotten something. And because I have a healthy brain, I have a method of solving the problem. Think for a moment about how you would solve the problem. I retrace my steps. Where was I? Okay, I was in the living room. I walked back into the living room. Ugh, dog, now I feed the dog. The way that might play out if I had an amnesic form of dementia is the same thing happens. I take the call from my sister. I hang up the phone. I notice that there are dishes in the sink. So I start washing the dishes. I notice that there's still some coffee in the coffee pot from the morning. So I pour it into a cup, I put it in the microwave, I heat it up. You gotta have a cookie with your coffee. So I grab that. I wonder what's on TV. So I just start moving through whatever comes next in my consciousness. I have no sense that I have forgotten something. My phone rings as I'm watching TV, it's my sister. Yeah, I'm watching TV. What? Well, you know what, if you wanted me to come to your house, maybe you should have told me you wanted me to come to your house. You never told me to come to your house. I would remember if you told me. You know what, maybe you should go to a doctor. 
That's the way it often plays out. You're never gonna win an argument with a person who's living with dementia. What my sister might be better off saying to me is, instead of, I told you you're supposed to come to my house, is, oh my gosh, have I forgotten again? I'm so terrible. Would you mind coming to the house? We'd all really love to see you. Once you put me in a position where I feel attacked and where I feel ashamed of myself, my anxiety is gonna go way up and everything is gonna get worse. So memory loss that disrupts daily life. I'm not able to get things done because I don't remember that I have forgotten things. Challenges in planning or solving problems. So one of the things that we lose pretty much with all forms of dementia, whether or not they're amnesic, is the ability to follow a sequence of steps. So this is where, where you might make, a person with dementia might make a, the same, oh yay, grandma's bringing her biscuits and everybody goes to eat one and there's like, whoa, how much salt is in these biscuits? Because grandma doesn't really remember the memory anymore, the, the recipe anymore. Um, this could look like, I'll give you an example. Um, my husband is making a ham and cheese sandwich. This is what happened. He was making a ham and cheese sandwich. I watch as he goes to the refrigerator and he grabs the ham, he grabs the bread, he grabs the mayonnaise, he goes and finds, he gets some cheese, he pulls out a drawer and grabs a knife. And he then uh, looks at the bread, he looks at the ham and cheese, and he starts pounding on the counter because he can't remember the first step in the sequence of how to build a sandwich. This might also look like this. My stepdad, Ken, is making uh, his, he has a routine. His routine is that every day he gets up, he, he makes the coffee, he goes and he watches TV um, while the coffee is brewing. This one morning I get a call from my mom and she says, for crying out loud today, instead of putting the water into the coffee maker, Ken put the cream right into the coffee maker. I guess I have to take that job away from him. And what I said to my mom is, mom, what we wanna do with a person who's living with dementia, the kind thing to do is do everything we can to help them hang on to their routines. Routines are so important. They make us feel connected. They make us feel like we're in control. So you don't wanna take the coffee away from him. What you wanna do is help him be successful in the task that he is no longer able to complete. I'm gonna step ahead for a second and introduce you to one of my heroes, which is Dr. Alan Power. He has a book called Dementia Beyond Disease, which I love. And he talks about this concept called cognitive ramps. The idea of cognitive ramps is this. Just like if I were to have, um, if I were on stage and I had somebody joining me on stage, I would need to, who is in a wheelchair. I would wanna build a physical ramp so that they can come up and be on stage with me in order for them to be successful. In order for them to get on stage, they need a ramp. So I would build that for them. Similarly, for somebody living with dementia, I wanna look at the things that might get in the way of their being successful and create ramps for them. So what I said to my mom is, let's look at some cognitive ramps that will allow Ken to keep doing the things he loves to do. So what do we do? So what we do is we fill a little pitcher with water and we put that next to the coffee machine. Maybe we fill out a little sign that says water and we tape that onto the coffee machine so that Ken can get the job done and is allowed to hang on to his routine. So these challenges in planning and problem solving, like we all run into that from time to time. I absolutely will forget a recipe that I thought was in my head and I have to go look at how to do it or look at instructions. Every time I thread my sewing machine, I still have to look at the instructions. Difficulty completing familiar tasks at home. And part of the reason for that difficulty is because of these challenges that we run into. People can, can, run, in, can run into confusion with time or place. We already talked about the place piece for people who are living with Alzheimer's disease, for instance. And people also start having challenges um, understanding the concept of time. And so I uh, just want to be aware of that when somebody asks me, um, when are we going? And I say that we're going at three o'clock. Are they still able to understand what three o'clock is? Or do I say soon? I figure out what works for the person I'm supporting. 
Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. There are significant visual changes that happen for a person who's living with dementia. And some of these, um, so for instance, um, part of it has to do with, um, again, back to that processing part, our brain can only process so much stuff. So as my brain processes less and less because of my dementia, um, and by the way, the way that you can think about this is that imagine that in order to solve a problem, I take in input and my brain needs to go someplace to get the appropriate output. If my brain is losing brain tissue, then to find the appropriate output, my brain goes here, but it says, oh no, there's a bridge out. Let me go here. Ah, there's a bridge out there too. Let me try this way. Oh no. By the time my brain can find a path to the thing it's looking for, a lot of time has gone by. So we said normal aging, you lose processing speed, but for people with dementia, that processing speed is really, really hammered. How hammered? Well, it can take somebody living with dementia up to 20 seconds to answer a question, a very simple question because of that input output processing flow. So if you think about that, 20 seconds. So if I were to say to you, hey mom, would you like to have the ham sandwich or the turkey sandwich for lunch? That was five seconds. Most of us would have lost patience by then. Mom, hello, did you want, we raise our volume. Did you want the ham or the turkey? We need to give people time to be able to answer a question. So that processing issue also impairs our vision. So for somebody living with um, mid-stage dementia, it's almost like they're looking at the world through binoculars. They have a very limited field of vision because that's all that my brain can process and keep me safe. So what does that mean? It means that I don't wanna come in from the side. I wanna greet somebody from the front. I don't wanna come in behind somebody. It also means that I, if somebody is um, looking down at their plate, for instance, they might not be able to see it because it's not in their field of vision. So I might need to move the plate out a bit. It might mean that when I'm walking with somebody, they always insist on walking behind me. And it's because that way they can keep me in their field of vision. Additionally, people have issues with colors that are on the same colors that are um, all in one space. Let me tell you what I mean. My husband would go to our um, white bathroom that had white tiles, white floor, white toilet. He would shut the door and pee on the wall because the toilet became invisible. So families will do things like put red tape around the toilet seat or change the toilet seat, put red tape along the line of a white bathtub so that people don't fall into it. If I'm going to help you do a cognitive ramp by placing your clothes out on the bed to make it easier for you to dress yourself, I'm not going to put your camel hair sweater and your khaki pants on a beige bedspread because you won't be able to see them. We already talked about the fact that there are new problems in speaking or writing. Um, certainly the ability, misplacing things and the ability to retrace steps. And so I start buying duplicates of things because I know that they're going to get lost, for instance. And I don't, if somebody says they can't find it, I don't say things like, don't you remember? Well, they don't. Decreased or poor judgment, people will make decisions that don't make a whole lot of sense because of their inability to um, process a logical uh, processing of consequences. So spending money where they shouldn't be spending money, um, doing things that are dangerous or reckless. I remember my friend's husband who had uh, frontotemporal dementia was out in the yard cutting branches. And usually what he would do is he would put them in a wood chipper. But what he did is he came inside and he put them in the garbage disposal. <sighs> So doing things that just don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Withdrawal from work or social activities, it gets harder and harder for people to stay uh, connected to conversations um, and to um, the things that they once loved. People tend to start having a bit of apathy once they loved mountain biking or biking or hiking, and they just don't seem that interested in it anymore. That's kind of a normal, 
happenstance with dementia. And what we don't want to get into is a routine of nagging people to do the things that they once loved to do. We accept the fact that people kind of withdraw from things. Remember that um, in the earliest stages of memory, because of this processing speed issue, early stages, I'm talking typically before somebody is even diagnosed, they are missing about one in every four or five words that other people are saying, because by the time their brain is processing what's being said, they skip a beat and they miss something. And so what that translates to as the person living with dementia is, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm having a harder and harder time understanding conversations with that guy. I don't really wanna to talk to him anymore. You might notice that in a social setting, somebody with dementia will wander away and start looking at their phone. They don't wanna be a part of the conversation because they're starting to feel like, I don't know, maybe even stupid. They feel like they just can't keep up the way that they used to be able to keep up. Changes in mood and personality um, are different in the different for, for everybody. It's huge with the frontotemporal dementia. People seem like they've had a complete personality shift, but it's not unusual that people can seem somewhat different from who they have who they have always been. Another one of my heroes that I want to make sure you are aware of is Tipa Snow. So Tipa Snow. Um, this is her website. I highly recommend that you either go to YouTube, if you're supporting a person living with dementia, that you go to YouTube or that you um, go to her website and look at some of her videos, fabulous explanations about what dementia is, as well as hands-on practices about how to best support people. She and her team do free 30-minute consultations so you could go online and sign up and speak directly with her or with one of her team members about what's going on with you. She has support groups and they are for families, but they are also for the person living with dementia so that they can remain connected. They get to talk to other people about what's this like for you. I wanna point out that the University of Washington, the Memory and Brain Wellness Center is a resource that I list later on in this presentation. They too have support groups, both for people living with dementia and for people who are supporting them. Tipa Snow talks about something called the positive approach. When I approach people, as I mentioned, I always approach from the front and I always identify myself. There's a very specific way I do this. I hold up my hand. Here's my hand, here's my face, we're connected. Hey, it's Allison. So good to see you. And then I very slowly lower my hand so that they see my hand is coming in for a handshake, especially somebody with mid stage with that binocular vision. If they don't see my hand coming, if I just stick my hand out, they might not see it coming. So I approach like this, Allison, so good to see you. In care communities all the time, I see this, mom, mom, which one am I? Hey, hi, do you remember me? People are so desperate to have the person with dementia recognize them and remember them. We need to ask ourselves uh, whether or not that is helpful to the person living with dementia. And the answer is it's not. We don't wanna ask any questions that somebody is likely to get wrong. We want people to be successful. And so therefore I always start by identifying myself. And you know, frankly, I do this with people who don't have dementia. Who remembers everybody they've met? We use people's preferred names, speaking slowly and clearly because we recognize that people's processing speed is slowing down. And we tend to use fewer words as well. And there is that processing time piece. Communicating with compassion. I'm just gonna turn my timer off so it doesn't buzz. Pause that, okay. Um, reflect and validate emotions. Well, what we know is that people living with dementia can, um, can get upset about things think, and, and think about it, right? You can't do the things that you used to be able to do. I was always able to do this. Why can't I get the ladder open? Why can't I figure out how to make the washing machine work? People living with dementia live in a state of fairly constant anxiety. 
because the world is not the way that the world was. And it's a scary thing. And we need to recognize that. And so if somebody is starting to get agitated and upset because things aren't going the way that they wanted them to go, I could say, now calm down. You need to just calm down right now, which is what I mostly hear people say, but that's not gonna get you anywhere. Or you need to stop that. That is not appropriate behavior. Wow, that's not gonna work either. Instead, what I wanna do is say, mm, the washing machine can be so complicated you're really upset by that. I would be too. I'm so sorry. Or when my husband said to me, my buttons have stopped working. My buttons don't work. Oh, you're, you mean you can't button your shirt anymore? No, what I say is, I hate that for you. I am so sorry. How can I help? If I immediately reach out and say, here, 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 let me help you. What I'm doing is I'm saying, you're helpless. And we don't want people to feel helpless. We wanna give people the time that they need to do things for themselves as long as possible. Offering comfort and reassurance and checking our own emotional state. Oftentimes people who don't have dementia can act a lot like people who do have dementia when they're helping people with dementia. So important to take a big breath and calm ourselves. Respecting somebody's reality, it's not our job to correct people. Mom, you really don't need to wear three sweaters today. You look ridiculous. Instead, what I might do is say, wow, look at you. And I know that when we get outside and she gets hot, she'll start taking sweaters off. But if I challenge her and I say, you made a terrible decision by putting three sweaters on, I'm gonna get her into a position where she feels like she needs to defend herself. So I just want to be mindful about how am I making her feel? And I asked myself, what's the worst that could happen? Dad wants to go outside without his coat on. He's going to get cold. I, in one of the uh, groups, one of my students said to me, I don't know what to do. I've got this woman who is, uh, won't spit out her toothpaste. Like she swallows her toothpaste. And I said, and the problem is, she said, it's fluoride toothpaste. You know, like that's poison. And I said, so tell me more about this person. She said, okay, so she's a 92 year old woman. And I said, okay, stop right there. I promise you it's not the fluoride that's going to take her out. We need to really choose our battles when we're supporting a person living with dementia. Avoiding open-ended questions. When I ask a question like, who am I? That's an open-ended question. I, I don't know. I mean, especially because the person living with dementia um, might not wreck, even though I'm their daughter, for instance, they might remember their daughter as an 18 year old woman and they might think that I'm a complete stranger. So I don't wanna ask that kind of question. Similarly, questions like, what do you want for lunch? Can be really confusing for a person living with dementia. Instead, I say, do you want the ham sandwich or do you want the cheese sandwich? Talk to me. I hate it when people talk around a person with dementia, asking the person who they're with all of the questions. That's so insulting. Even if they are nonverbal and can no longer answer a question, I still look in their eyes and I ask them the question. Their care partner can answer the question, but I make sure that the person with dementia feels absolutely included. And I already talked about the fact that I'm not gonna argue and try to logic something out with somebody whose brain can't do that anymore. The one who needs to change great behaviors is the one with the healthy brain. And as I mentioned, respecting apathy. And this is something I run, I run into this a lot, especially of spouses of people living with dementia who are really bothered by the fact that their um, loved one doesn't wanna do some of the things that they consider to be really important in life. And it's really helpful if we can use nonverbal cues. I'm gonna pause there. There's more that I could say, but we're, we're at 45 minutes, I believe. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, so why don't I stop sharing for a moment and let's um let's go ahead and ask some questions. Okay. Um, so is getting frequently or more and more distracted a sign of cognitive or memory issues? It's a sign of aging. And I think that it's all degrees. So I think that we all get more distracted as we get older. And I think that um, the, the question is, where am I with that distraction? Am I able to... Uh, um, 
to still get, get on with life. Is distraction one of many different kinds of symptoms that are going on or is it the only thing that's going on? These are the kinds of questions that I would ask. But I would say that if you find yourself getting more distracted, maybe pay a little attention to why are you getting more distracted? Because it could also be something about medications you're taking. It could also be about sleep issues. So please don't jump to the conclusion that you have dementia because you're getting more distracted. I wanna really emphasize also one thing here, and that is that if you feel like you have some early signs that could possibly be dementia, um, and I, I always recommend that people go see a doctor because it may be that you have a form of mild cognitive impairment. So we talked about this 20 year span before people become symptomatic. The tail end of that 20 year span is when a person is living with mild cognitive impairment. So I've got some stuff that is making life harder, but I can still drive, for instance, I can maybe still go to work, but, I am, but there are some symptoms that are dementia-like. 10% of the time, mild cognitive impairment is reverse, something that's reversible, it's not dementia. It could be a vitamin B12 deficiency, it could be sleep issues. So um, I don't wanna get anybody's hopes up and say, like, ten, say that um, you gotta go because it's probably not dementia but it's always, it's worth checking. I, I do really encourage people to go get medical treatment. Is finding it more and more difficult to focus on a task, much less multitask, a sign of symptoms or memory loss? And again, not necessarily. Those are things that get harder as we get older, absolutely positively. The annual Medicare wellness check includes a brief memory quiz. Is that really adequate? Should you ask your provider for more? I think that if you're feeling like you are possibly symptomatic, that you should ask your provider for more. If nothing else, it sets up a baseline that you can compare against later, so why not? I think that it is, um, I think that there are other questions that doctors could be asking. I think that if you feel that you are possibly symptomatic at all, it's a really good idea to have a loved one in the room with you um, in case there are things that the doctor wants to check in with that person about. There is something called the mini cognitive exam that takes about two to three minutes that your doctor could give you. And part of that is the asking questions and seeing, uh, asking you to remember words and seeing if you can spit those back later on. Um, my sister almost any, forgets almost any immediate experience, but is still sharp as a tack with long-term memories. I'm sure she's not alone, but is there a name or an explanation connected to this specific disability? I need to say that I'm not, a, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor. If I had that experience myself, I would go see a doctor. Um, if she's sharp as a tack with everything else, name, reading, if she's still able to do math, if she's still able to drive a car, then I would see a doctor and see if there's something else going on with that. Because typically with dementia, it would be more than just that one thing that's going on. I'm trying to interact at a distance with a relative in early stages of memory loss. Okay, she's living with her son's family. She reports depression, yeah, a little interest. Is, okay, she, uh, in anything. She has few friends outside her son's family. Any suggestions to engage her? Well, first of all, let me just say yay you for taking the time to be with this friend. And it's not unusual at all that people in this situation are living with depression and apathy and feeling very alone. So I think that um, some things that I've seen people do that are helpful. There's an organization and it's in the handouts. I, ha I have it written out. It's an organization called Momentia, M-O-M-E-N-T-I-A. -M -M -E if you were to Google Momentia Seattle, they have a website that during pre and post COVID gives um, a listing of all kinds of activities that you can do that are specifically intended for people living with dementia and their care partners. Walks at Woodland Park Zoo, art programs at the Fry Art Museum, dance lessons, drumming circles, hikes. During the time of COVID, they have lots and lots of virtual things that you can do. And so you can do some of those virtual things online with another person. Additionally, um, the program that I introduced you to earlier, Zinnia TV, we are getting great feedback from people who are using that 
as a tool with people who are far away, that they'll run one of the little videos and that they pause it and talk about what they see. So I think that one of the great things we can do for people living with dementia is include, try to have as much novelty as possible, bring up new topics, um, show pictures and talk about those pictures. Um, what do you mean by fatal? They die with, they die, oh, okay, okay. So, um, so dementia, because we know that dementia um, is causing brain tissue to go away. So we know that that impacts our cognitive abilities, but eventually it impacts our physical abilities as well. So many people with dementia um, will eventually lose the ability to swallow, for instance, um, and that would lead to eventually a, a pneumonia. Um, so the, the cause of death might be pneumonia, but it's because of the fact that they aspirated because their brain, they lost the ability to swallow because their brain wasn't working anymore. So that's an example of, so yeah, it's not like you have dementia and you're totally healthy in every other way. And then bam, you're dead because you have Alzheimer's disease. It's that your body succumbs to the dementia as well as your brain succumbing to the dementia. Um, and other questions? Yes, I have one. Please. My question is in a visit to my family doctor whom I adore, but she was giving me one of those five minute, 10 minute, dementia tests, which I didn't do perfectly, the vision, the building the house and stuff. Sure. And so she told me, I said, well, do I have dementia? And she said, well, you don't have a diagnosis of that, but because you're smart, you can hide it a lot longer. And that stuck with me. Is that factual? Yeah. So, so here's the, the deal. If you were to take two brains of somebody who has, say, a, a, I'm going to get, I'm reversed here, but if you were to take two brains, you have a person with a third grade education and you have a person with a PhD and they have exactly the same amount of stuff in their brain that could, um, that would cause dementia symptoms. The person with the third grade education is going to be far more impacted at that stage than the person with the PhD. So it's not to say that incredibly bright people don't develop dementia symptoms, but their progression, it's a raw materials game at that point. I have more neurons that I have developed over a course of lifetime, my life. And so therefore I have more to lose before I become more symptomatic. So my progression might actually be from the time that this stuff started building up in my body, it will probably be a longer period of time before I become symptomatic. And so your brain is more able to find its way to the place that it ultimately wants to go because you have more neuronal pathways because you're a highly intelligent person. So if you look at the Lancet 2020 report, one of, some of the things that are recommended are um, novelty, keeping uh, yourself curious, keeping yourself interested. You're less likely you're, to have dementia symptoms if you are somebody who learns a new language later in life, if you take up a musical instrument, so you keep building neurons. And by the way, even people who have dementia are still building neurons, even though they're losing neurons. It's just that they're losing at a faster rate than they're building. Mm 